Well, hello everyone. This is David Henriksen with iDisciple Publishing. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I'm really excited to introduce to you my very good friend who I've been able to work with over the last couple months on an incredible story. This is Melissa Camp's mom, Jeanette Henning. Jeanette, welcome. Thank you. Great to have you here today. Jeanette is the co-author of our latest release called Melissa If One Life. And the other co-author is actually your daughter, yes. Melissa Camp, because Melissa If One Life is a compilation of Melissa's journals. Mm -hmm. And you serve as sort of the narrator, exactly. as, as we've discussed. And so you are co-authors of this book. This story has first been made available through the release of the movie, I Still Believe, mm -hmm which releases today, as a matter of fact, it is March 13th of 2020. You and I got to see the movie together yeah. last night. It really is incredible. But I've had the opportunity to work with Jeanette. It's been a couple months now right. as we together sort of bring this book to market. The iDisciple team is so excited about what this book is gonna do for Melissa's legacy, mm -hmm. but really for the spiritual walk of so many so people many. Yes. around the world. There's a lot in her journals, mm -hmm. and we talked about this earlier today, but if, if you wouldn't mind sort of dialing back the clock to when Melissa was young, mm -hmm. and talk maybe about what journaling meant to her, mm -hmm. and when she sort of first said, hey mom, you're gonna be the caretaker of these uh, journals. Yes, yes. Well, really, Melissa started writing like in the first grade. She had a teacher who um, encouraged her students to do creative writing. So I think she fell in love with writing when she was just little. Oh, wow. And she would have a diary. You know, back then it was a <laughs> diary. In fact, she says one of the cutest things in, in her journal. She goes, oh, Lord, remember when I used to have a diary and I talked to Haley and I would talk to, you know, and she mentioned her girlfriend's names. And she goes, now I talk to you. So she mm. transitioned, I think, from diaries to journals um, early in high school, you know, as a, as a young woman who began to have this really, really strong walk with God. Mm -hmm. And she began journaling extensively throughout high school and, uh, you know, early, early college. And yet just uh, before they were married, Melissa and Jeremy got married and she was packing up her stuff. She packed all her journals in a box and she said, Mom, I have something for you. I want you to keep these for me. They're very, very precious. They're my journals. Wow. And so they were in a box and you know, I put them in her, her closet and kept them there until after she died when the Lord uh, said, go pick out a journal and start mm -hmm. reading. Wow. When, well, maybe before I, I talk about sort of the location of the journals, because I think you had to do some gathering, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, as we were putting mm -hmm. the book together. But could you maybe talk a little bit about, because a lot of people are gonna see the movie, mm -hmm. I still believe, the story of Jeremy and, and Melissa Camp. Mm -hmm. Part of the movie making sort of process was bringing to life, or maybe a side, a side project of it was bringing to life Melissa's journals. Can you maybe right. tell our, our viewers sort of how that how that came about? Yes, um, I started transcribing her journals, you know, shortly after her death, seeing how special they were. So I started to transcribe them. And during the uh, interviewing and movie making process, the Irwin brothers became very aware of Melissa's journals. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy had uh, given them some writings of Melissa's. So they were learning about her and um, figuring out who this character was through her journals and through interviews with Jeremy and me and her dad and her sister. So the journals were very um, instrumental in making the movie and they do show that throughout the movie. Right, about, yeah. You know, start right away with her journals being, being a focal part of her life and what she was doing with them. So I thought they did that beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I was really pleased with that. And one thing that Andy Irwin told me that he loved also was at the very end of the movie when they have that collage of pictures and they have her journal. Right, right. And they, you know, 
use the wind or whatever to flip the page of the journal and it shows how she would circle things and yeah. and that was her actual journal oh. that's her journal that's her writing and he said i fought for them to put that in there it was so important for me to have melissa's journal be the last thing people saw yeah. i thought that was awesome well and, and it's a it's a gripping part of the movie i yes. mean it, it really does stand out so yes. Let's maybe talk a little bit about the relationship of the of the journals and, mm -hmm. and the movie a little bit. So mm -hmm. one of the things that happens in the movie early on is is the character playing Jeremy says, Can I read your journal? Right. Did that did that happen? Was Jeremy asking you know, Melissa I, to read her journals? Yeah, you know, that might have happened. <laughs> I certainly wasn't privy to that. I was, you know, sitting by their side every on every date, that's for sure. But you know, that more than likely did happen. Sounds like Jeremy. Yeah. If she had her Bible, she had her journal. Yeah. You know, she yeah. was also a note taker. So whenever she would, you know, be at a, a church or listen to a sermon or a Bible study, she also took notes and then she would communicate with the Lord about what she had just heard or read. Yeah. So that was so she always had it with her. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um the 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 person that Melissa was. Mm -hmm comes through her journals right. and and therefore is in this book. Yes. I mean, we learn mm -hmm. truly about the the spirit and the mm -hmm. character and the faith right. of of Melissa, Melissa Henning, Melissa Camp. Yes. So the first part, I think in, in the book, we, we start to sort of get a sense for her relationship with Jeremy. Right. As as you were rereading the journals and doing your narration. Can you maybe give us a glimpse as to mm -hmm. how their relationship went? Because there were some breakups at there the beginning and, and then it turns into this beautiful love story. Right, and it really was a love story from the very, very beginning. Um, I, won't, I will never forget the day they met because she was at a junior college and she would go to a uh, college campus Bible study that was led by uh, Jason Duff was his name. And Jeremy was Jason's best friend. They had met at Calvary Chapel Bible College. Mm -hmm. And he was smitten with Melissa. And he asked Jeremy to come and lead worship at this little Bible study because he wanted him to meet Melissa. <laughs> I think she's the one. It's an interesting <laughs> beginning to, yes, the, yes. to the story, yes. It is, so <laughs> how they have that in the movie yeah. is, you know, they put some characters together, but this is how that part of it is, is true. So Jeremy came to do worship at this, mm. it was a small Bible study on campus. And uh, as she tells the story, and he does too, that he was doing worship and she was worshiping. She was a hand lifter. Yeah. You know, yeah. she would praise the Lord and hands lifted high to heaven, like they say in the movie. And she would worship and she came home and told me the story that, um, mom, mom. You know, she goes rushing in the front door. She goes, I met somebody today and it was so awesome. We were doing worship and I had my hands lifted and I was praising God and I just opened my eyes for some reason. And I just connected with this guy who was leading worship. And she goes, I've never felt anything like that before. You know, it was an immediate connection between the two of them. God ordained, I am, I know, absolutely. So that connection happened with him and with her yeah. at that exact point in time. So God began doing that little seed. And we had a uh, college Bible study in our home, and Mark would always call it Melissa's Bible study because <laughs> she was the one who would gather the people to come, and we would have 60, 70 oh people gosh, in, our, yes. in our home, and Jeremy was part of that group. And there was a group of friends that they just all connected so well with. Mm. So he would come and play worship at, at our Bible study, and this group just started to connect with each other. In the movie, they show them having Bible studies at the beach and them singing worship. That did happen. They did that all the time. So it was, you know, a friendship at first, but it was a connection the two had that was undeniable. And it's throughout her journals from the very first time she met him that there was something special in him and uh, that she could see Jesus in him. And she was so attracted to him because of Jesus and his love for God and how he made her more excited about growing in in her faith. Wow. So there was Jason. Yes. There that was, was a part of it. there was a Jason yep. who in the movie it's a John Luke. <laughs> right. But it was it was Jason and they did have that little thing going on where she didn't want Jason to know that she and Jeremy were seeing each other and she didn't want to hurt Jason's feelings right. and right. so they did have this drama as you know, I mean they were so young. So it's, it was almost like a high school drama, but you know, it was when they were 
19 and 2021. 20, so that did go on yeah. and between best friends, Jeremy wow. and Jason. I think your words actually in the in the book were after much drama, yes. <laughs> Melissa and there Jeremy was, were able yeah, to sort of be public there about their there relationship. There definitely with one was yeah. uh, much drama. Mostly just like the movie said, I don't want to hurt his feelings. Yeah. I don't want yeah. to hurt his feelings. Even though she did not have that feeling towards him, she was very sensitive to his feelings towards her. One of the things that's apparent in the journals right away is Melissa and, and to some extent Jeremy, because she's mm -hmm. journaling about this, mm -hmm. were two people who wanted to make sure that their relationship with God right. came before Absolutely. their relationship with one another. I mean, that, that just was a consistent pattern throughout. Right, that, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in fact, with Melissa, um, I mean, she was so attracted to him and she'd never had anything like that happen in her life before. But instead of being like the crazy girl who's just so in love and gives up everything for, for the guy, <laughs> she was not giving up Jesus for anything. Yeah. And she knew God was calling her to a higher purpose, to something amazing, she knew it. And Jeremy was a distraction. And so their first breakup was, you're a distraction. And I know God is setting me apart for something amazing. And I need to have this time focused just between me and Jesus without distractions, which really broke Jeremy's heart because, yeah. you know, he's like ready to marry her when she was 19 years old. I'm taking you to Indiana. I want you to introduce Meet you my to, family. My, to exactly. my family, yeah. to my parents. And she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, you know, it's like she was not ready for that yet. And she knew she still had this journey with Jesus that she needed to uh, cultivate yeah. even more. Well, I, I'm looking forward to when the readers experience this from Melissa's journals and from your narration about mm -hmm. the priority of God, mm -hmm. because it was it's it's been so clear from me getting to know you and Mark, mm -hmm. from reading Melissa's journals, from seeing the movie that that you all as a family and Jeremy and Melissa mm -hmm. never got that wrong. Right. I mean, I mean, God right. was the first priority in Absolutely. their lives. It's been that way in your life, right. and and it's just it's just such a beautiful picture. Yes. Unfortunately, we also get sort of the the, the next part of the journey through mm -hmm. the journals as well, mm -hmm. which is Melissa's cancer, right. and one of the things that we have been talking about at I Disciple Publishing and in our interaction with you all is almost like God coming first with before Melissa and Jeremy's mm -hmm. relationship, mm -hmm. Melissa's faith never wavered never. through mm -hmm. what I call a roller coaster. Right. It must it have been Absolutely. much worse for, for you all, but as I'm reading it, these ups and downs of the diagnoses and the treatment and the reaction, mm -hmm. but her mm -hmm. faith mm -hmm. and what I would, I would almost say her joy, mm -hmm. Absolutely. never wavered no. either. No. How, how how can yes. you explain that to our viewers, just how strong mm -hmm. and faithful and committed of a believer that she was? I can only explain it in the supernatural because her responses were not the normal responses that anyone would have, let alone a young girl who's only 19 or 20 years old. So it was her relationship with God, her closeness with him, as you'll see the journals are her conversations with God, yeah. intimate conversations with God, where she just pours herself and God pours himself in, into her. So she had that knit and the fruit of the spirit is love and joy, which I think those two things um, really show who Melissa is more than anything. Mm -hmm. This supernatural she, love she had for Jesus, for Jeremy, but for her mom and her dad and her family and her friends. I mean, she was love to people, strangers, yeah. That's that's just who she was. And joy. Joy filled her heart and filled her life. No matter what the circumstances were, she had this incredible joy in her life, which people craved. Like, you know, what's going on with her that she has got joy like that? Even me. Yeah. You know, I mean, I struggled. I'm not going to say I didn't struggle with, with all of this. And she would be the one comforting me. Mm. You know, she would be the one, Mom, God's ways are not our ways. Yeah. They're beyond our finding out. You know, and she would always lead me to the throne room. Yeah. She would always lead me to where our joy comes from. One of the things that you have done in Melissa, If One Life, the book, is you've given us some quotations. Yes. You've given us some of the things that she's said. And yes. I've, got a, I've got a couple here that if you wouldn't mind commenting on. Sure. 
Melissa wrote, eternity has no troubles, mm -hmm. eternity of blessings. Mm -hmm. So even though now you're having the wind against you, know God knows and sees what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Pray, walk away amazed and, and full, full of worship. worship. Yes. And then here's the other one that, she's, that she wrote to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Your will be done in my life big or small mm -hmm. i'm willing for it all mm -hmm. this journey is ours let's, let's go. go i love you so much i know awesome huh? yeah it's just I amazing know. this picture of someone who again never wavered and right the movie is a wonderful picture of i think yeah. her and jeremy's love story and and then this journey but maybe the movie got wrong a little bit her re some of her reactions oh, absolutely. because yes. she was full of gratitude, yes. full of praise, full right. of faith, full of obedience yes. the whole time. And excitement. And excitement. She was excited about the journey that God had for her, for sure. And the one thing I want to say about that first journal entry that you were reading about eternity has no, no troubles. I remember when I was <laughs> reading this one, I thought how amazing God is. He's using my own daughter to counsel me right now knowing that my wind is against, you know, the right. wind is against my back right. and that I'm going through this. And she's like, mom, mom, get this. God knows and sees what you're going through, mom. Pray, walk away. Unbelievable. Worship, yeah. you know. It's amazing. It was her counsel to me at the time. And I can remember it so clearly the first time I, I read that. One of the things that I'd, I'd like for our viewers to understand is kind of going back to the roller coaster. Uh -huh. So her medical condition, please make sure I get this mm -hmm. right, started with a misdiagnosis of Correct. an ovarian cyst, Correct. but it was removed. Mm -hmm. Then there was the discovery of, of stage three ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. Then there was prayer, I mean, mm -hmm. across radio stations mm -hmm. and in concerts mm -hmm. and friends and, around and family the around, really the, around the world. Yes. And then a tumor disappears, right. but then there is the recognition mm -hmm. that there are microcells right. in her liver, I, I think it was, microscopic or cells microscopic, microscopic cells in the yes. liver. So this was mm -hmm. a, a constant mm -hmm. sort of right. ordeal exactly. that had highs and yes, lows exactly. and, and rejoicing mm -hmm. and grief. Right. And yet you've got Melissa, yeah. <laughs> Melissa who is who is steady and well, talk about that a little bit because mm -hmm. how she affected the people around her right. during this right. turmoil and up and down was was part of her legacy and part of her ministry. Exactly. And you were just saying a little bit earlier how her responses were so different than what normal people would have. Yeah. You know, and finding out she has cancer, it's like, oh, mom, that is so great. God's going to do such amazing things. So she had that in her so much so that she knew along this path, God was going to do amazing things. Yeah. So she was settled in that in her heart, knowing that uh, this journey was what God was taking her on. They were doing this together. Yeah. So uh, for me... I think I was kind of numb, you know, because honestly, that's what happens to you, especially, you know, after her cancer surgery, I literally was kind of like numb. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't think correctly. You're kind of like, uh, mom, bring me some chicken noodle soup and I bring her a split pea soup or, you know, <laughs> something to where you're just not, con you're sure. not connecting because it's such, it's, it's trauma. It's trauma. It's traumatic. It's absolute exactly. trauma and you don't even realize it, but it is. So it's hard for you to, to navigate. But we just took a day at a time mm. and we hung on to Jesus, you know, and I did not falter in that, that he is in control of all things and that all his ways are good and kind yeah. and that he has a plan for this. So we hung on. We always believed. Um, I did believe in her healing. I believed God was going to heal her. Um, I fasted for it, prayed for it. Yeah. I, um, they believed it with all of their heart that God was going to heal them. So it, it was a journey that had highs and lows. And yeah. To, to sort of paint this picture even a little bit further, after I think surgery number two, mm -hmm. she woke up mm -hmm. and 
her mind is on somebody else, exactly. on Miles McPherson. On Miles McPherson. So tell that story just so people can have such a clear yeah. picture of the spirit of Melissa right. as she's dealing with, right. with this cancer. Yeah, Miles McPherson is a pastor at the Rock Church, and uh, Melissa would go there on Sunday nights with a bazillion other <laughs> young people. It was just amazing, and he had such a gift of evangelism and communicating the Word of God. And he had something in his throat, whether it was a tumor, whatever, that he needed surgery. And we were all praying because we did not want him to lose his voice because he, God was using him so powerfully. So Melissa was totally on her knees for Miles, that he, God would heal him, that his, his voice would be saved and preserved. And we would fast for him, pray for him. Well, his surgery was on the exact day of Melissa's surgery, May the 1st, 2000. So, um, when she started to wake up just a little bit groggy, the very first thing she said to me was, Mom, how's Miles? <laughs> first thing she said. And I'm like, oh, honey, Miles is fine. And then she went back to sleep for a little bit, woke up again just a little bit. Mom, are you fasting for Miles? Yes, honey, I'm <laughs> fasting. And yes, so her mm. first thought was for Miles. And I got to tell him that the other day and told him that it was in the book. So. So he was happy about that but um, yeah she's a special girl yeah there's a there's a point in the movie where Jeremy takes her back to the original mm. auditorium where they locked where right. they locked eyes right and the the character in the movie I think her line is something like maybe God doesn't want me right. to be healed from this maybe right. that's the story yes did did you all ever have a sense going through the roller coaster and through the experience yeah. and through the trauma? You are such faithful people mm -hmm. and you were praying and fasting mm -hmm. for a healing. Mm -hmm. Was there a point anywhere during that time where her family or Jeremy yeah. or other than her right. maybe said, this story may be diff playing out differently than we hope? Right. Um, of course for me something the Lord did for me because if I would project ahead to the fear of my daughter dying which is the worst fear of a mother of her lifetime yeah, is to lose sure. a child if I would even think about that I had no peace I had no calm I began to have anxiety you know where you just can't even you can't even breathe and like how do you how do you survive that so the Lord showed me quickly that I had to stay in the moment. I had to stay today, take a moment at a time. And if I did that, I had peace. Yeah. I had his filling. I could handle what he brought me for that moment, for that day. But if I looked ahead as the what ifs and what could happen and God's not gonna heal her, I did not have his peace. I did not have his joy. Mm. I, I could not function. So I learned early to not go there. Yeah, yeah. And to just walk what he gave me, uh, trust the promises he gave me in the word. And he, he did some amazing things with me to lead me on this journey, mm. to continue to give me hope. Because if you have no hope, you can't function. So I always had the hope of, of what he was doing. Now other people, my uh, oldest daughter, she was fearful all the time. Mm. She did not believe Melissa was gonna be healed. And you know, I'm thankful that she kept many of those fears from me, but she yeah. did have those fears. Mm. Now, Jeremy's parents and, um, you know, how they show them kind of like, you're going to marry her? What? Uh, that's very true. Mm, okay. He had people caution him. Uh, um, he had Jason Duff <laughs> caution him, like, what are you doing? You know, mm. you shouldn't be uh, marrying someone with cancer. You know, think about this, what could happen? And so he had many people try to discourage him in uh, them getting married and him doing yeah. this walk with her. So yeah, there were there were people who didn't didn't believe and mm. who were were struggling with it. But for the most part, you know, we had faith. And Jeremy's parents were were awesome and great. And you know, they came several times from Indiana. And you know, we would all pray together and and have scriptures. We call them our promises. Mm. Melissa would write them on That's little good. cards, and we would claim promises and pray out the promises. So that was a a, a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah, we stayed focused. We've had we've had such an incredible experience working on this publication with you, and one of the things that you were 
committed to. You were headstrong. You were stubborn. You were like, <laughs> these are going to get in, in the book right. or some songs. Right. And, and one of them that's just particularly meaningful to me, just because I, I remember hearing it for the first time, is the Ginny Owens, Ginny Owens song, If You Want Me To. Exactly. Can, can you maybe talk about what that song meant at the time and, and sort right. of even looking back right. on it now, why you wanted it in the book so much? Well, it's really so much of Melissa's journey. And when uh, she first was sick, even before we knew she had she had cancer, a friend of hers gave her the Jenny Owens CD. Mm -hmm. And that song so resonated with her. I'll walk through the valley if you want me to. Yeah. yeah and I'll go through the fire if you want me to. And it was something that she wrote out. She wrote out word for word. And when she began to have medical tests, that was in the front of her notebook when she would go to the doctors and she would read that over again. And she would cry out to the Lord and say, this is my heart, whatever you want me to, I'll go through the valley if you want me to. You know, in my deepest, darkest valleys, the Lord's with her. So it was very, very instrumental in their walk. Yeah. And the other thing about that song is when Melissa had her cancer surgery and Jeremy showed up at the hospital um, and he had seen her he came out to talk to me and I was telling him about that song and about Melissa's heart and how she was okay because she was so focused on the Lord and what God was going to do in her life and he had to drive up to uh, Huntington Beach and about an hour away from where we were at the hospital to do worship that night mm. and he tells me that as he was driving up there you know, he put on Ginny Owen's CD and he listened to that song and he started weeping and weeping in the car, knowing that that was Melissa's heart. Yeah. You know, he could just see mm -hmm. it and feel it. And, um, you know, he loved her so much and he had tried to uh, depart from that because of their several, <laughs> their several breakups. So he had hardened his heart yeah. and was yeah. trying to, right. but God broke his heart for her mm -hmm. in that car. And that's when he says, Lord, Lord, if she tells me she loves me, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> Boom. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So that song, you know, is part of their journey. It's part of their story. It's yeah. what God used to connect them and to get them married. Right. Because that was a miracle moment. Right. Because at that moment, Melissa began to have this need to tell him she loved him. <laughs> it, it comes out in the movie as well. I yes. mean, it, it's, it's, yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's just a great, a great picture of their relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk, if you don't mind, about some more of the construction of the book. Okay. And one of those elements is the title. Mm. So the, the title of this book mm -hmm. is Melissa, If One Life. Mm -hmm. And these are Melissa's words. Yes. If one life comes to know Jesus Christ as their Savior mm -hmm. because of what I go through, mm -hmm. it will be worth it. Be worth it, absolutely. Yeah, so the title of the book, I struggled for years because I knew I was going to write a book. I yeah. knew I was going to put this, um, her journals out there. And, you know, I, I wrote several things. I thought, you know, nothing sat right. Absolutely nothing sat mm. right with having the right title. I mean, it's a huge thing. Yes. You know, that's right. It's a huge thing to, to name it and, um, and you know, this quote is throughout the movie, they use the movie, change the quote just a tiny, tiny bit. But if one life just kept sticking out to me as, you know, that was her heart was if one life. And then of course her name. So it's almost like a quote from Melissa, Melissa comma, if one life, yeah. it's the beginning of that statement because that is who she is. It's who she was, it's what she lived her mm -hmm. life for is to win one life to Jesus and one more and one more and one more as many as God would gather to them, himself. And when I came up with that, when I came up with it, when I wrote it for the first time, it was like, <gasps> you know, <gasps> I got it. That's it. <laughs> you know, you were just, yeah. I was just like, yeah. it is you know, the perfect I just title. knew that that was it. And I can remember sharing it with, uh, sharing it with somebody. And they said to me, oh, I just got goosebumps. I got goosebumps because that's just so her. It was so yeah. right. You know, so I just feel like that was really the Lord and it's the right title. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 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 how she felt it's it, it, exactly you know, it's it's, it's incredible she, it's what she lived for yeah i, I want to some of the things that are in the book 
are some letters mm -hmm. that she wrote, so, some other things that, mm -hmm. that may have been included in her journals, right. but but yeah, she would write her kind letters of supplements. In her yeah, she wrote these letters, <laughs> and one that one that stood out to me, I think, was to her sister. Mm -hmm. And and so, could you maybe talk mm -hmm. about? when you were reading her journals or even yeah. as you look back on, on Melissa's legacy, yeah. how impacted she was by her siblings and how she, yes. she loved and, yes. and, 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 I love and that built letter. into her siblings. Yeah, I love that letter. Yeah. It's so great because um, Heather, and she loved Heather so much, older sister, but Melissa was still her mentor, mm. Heather's mentor and her Discipler and the one who was drawing her to Jesus and the one who constantly while she was away at college doing what college kids do She would be writing her letters. Yeah, and you know at first she might have been maybe a little strong with her like, you know <laughs> Come on walk with Jesus and then as the letter in here reveals it's almost an apology letter to Heather That she might have been too strong with her in the beginning. She goes and then I then I realized that you were just stuck in the doo-doo. I just thought that was the <laughs> cutest thing. You were just stuck in the doo-doo. And what you needed was my love and my prayers. And I'll say that to Heather. You're stuck in the doo-doo. Yeah. You know, yeah. that we understand We've all that. been stuck, all in stuck in the doo-doo probably at some point. Stuck That's in the right. Doo -doo. And what we need to do for one another is to love you through it and pray for you and commit you to the Lord and be there, mm. you know, through through that journey. So I just love that little letter <laughs> that she wrote to her sister, you know, telling her how much she loved her. Yeah. And uh, yes, they had a very, very uh, special uh, relationship. And Heather was drawn to Jesus mm. because of Melissa. Yeah. And she would, this was cute though, because she was away at college, you know, hours away from, uh, in Northern California and we're in Southern California. And Melissa had this amazing relationship starting with Jeremy and all of his friends in this Bible study. So she came home for the summer and was like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, and she was really impacted by all of these people who were so on fire for Jesus, so on fire for him, sold out, committed, that she was like, oh my gosh, Lord, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I need to walk that walk. So she even left school for a semester and um, went to... Uh, an evangelism school, mm. school of evangelism, and got herself prepared to go back to Chico State and be a missionary then. So really yeah. committed her life to walk strong, strong with God. So that was an amazing, yeah. amazing thing, yeah. The, the, the picture from her journals, from the book, from the movie, in my opinion, is just crystal clear. Mm -hmm. This is somebody who is full of faith mm -hmm. and serving others mm -hmm. and obedience and praise and right. joy and love and kindness. I mean, oh, it's yes. we get such a beautiful picture of Melissa. I just have to ask, mm -hmm. as you went back through the journals, mm -hmm. as you were creating this incredible publication called mm -hmm. Melissa, If One Life, anything new that you learned anything that you were surprised oh, by I, that I, you I, said oh this is something that i didn't quite grasp before um i think it was just the depth of her relationship with the lord mm -hmm. i mean i knew that she was strong yeah and uh, but it was so deep in her conversations with the lord and how he was leading her mm -hmm. i could see his fingerprints from you know when she was young and in high school his fingerprints all over this, leading her, guiding her moment yeah. by moment. You know, the steps that he had planned for her. Those are the things that opened my eyes as to what God was doing in her life. Whereas when you're living it, you're not quite aware. But reading it and seeing it all together and how God was preparing her and strengthening her and, and had this incredible, strong relationship with her and the people that he brought into her life yeah. that helped her even I have one thing in there where she wrote meeting this man at the beach who <laughs> was just an amazing thing that the two of them this older man you know like a grandfather came out and saw her and knew God was leading her. the two of them having this incredible Jesus connection and yeah. this conversation they had with one another I'm just reading that and it's just so beautiful and how God was leading leading her there to have a more of a hunger for heaven mm -hmm. more of a hunger for home I mean, was it beautiful? Yeah. I just loved it. Yeah. It was just beautiful. So there were things in there that I had not, of course, known. Yeah. But it was uh, her walk with God, her strength, and 
you know, that's the way she was. She would say to me, hey, mom, let's be Mary's today, which meant let's go sit at the feet of Jesus. That's what we're doing today. Oh Grab your Bible. We're sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mm. Let's be Mary's. Yeah. You know, so she, she challenged me as well in, in my walk. And, and Mark, the first time he read the journals, he said, oh, you know, he's walked strong with God for a very, very long time. He goes, oh, I felt like a baby Christian, mm. you know, that <laughs> I did not have that kind of an intimacy with God that she expresses. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to transition to you and Mark a, okay. a little bit. Before we do that, I do want you to tell our, our viewers, if you don't mind, the story of the yellow and red roses oh, from the yes. hospital room. Because yeah. this is also like, if, if we really want to clarify and nail down yeah. that what you and I are saying about Melissa is absolutely That's true. true. The story of the yellow and red roses is pretty pretty amazing. I mean, she was so focused on other people as Absolutely. she's going through chemo and surgery Absolutely. and all those other things. Absolutely. Well, she loved red and yellow roses. <laughs> she just loved the combination of them. She loved them. And so after her cancer surgery, her friends decide, oh, we're gonna fill the room with red and yellow roses. So they, they got these huge bouquets and put them in her, in her room. So when she would wake up from her surgery, she'd see these red and yellow roses. And, right from the very beginning when she would wake up. Um, if there was a doctor or a nurse or someone coming in to take her blood, many times they won't connect. You know, they kind of look past you. They don't want to get too involved. You know, it's, it's too emotionally hard to connect with a cancer patient. Yeah. patient. And so they would kind of look past her, but she would always connect with them. She'd always, first of all, thank them. Thank you so much for serving me. <laughs> You know, and they'd look at her like, I'm sticking a needle in your right, arm. Right, right. And she's thanking me for serving her. And then she'd say, Mom, Mom, get a rose for her. And then they'd ask, what color would you like? Would you like a red one or a yellow one? Of course, they have to engage. Oh, thank you, honey. Sure, I'll take a red one or I'll take a yellow one. Whether it was a man or a woman. Right. The doctor would come in. Mom, Mom, get him a rose. <laughs> Every single person had to have a rose before they left that room. Mm. She would have- And you said um, you would be walking down the halls of oh, the hospital yeah. and you would see people would, carrying roses. They a, must have just been with I'd Melissa. I'd take a little break so other people could go in and visit with her. <laughs> yeah. And I would sit in the hallway and I'd see these people coming down the hall with red and yellow roses. And I'd say to them, oh, you just saw Melissa. And they would just be beaming, just be beaming. But that's who she was. And, and friends would always bring things. I remember one dear friend, she brought a huge basket of chocolate bars and granola bars and nuts and mom pass those around to the nurses take those to the nurses station or these uh, she was a nanny to five children and they just loved her adored her and, and uh, they got together with their friends and they made all these little lotions with little bible verses on them to bring to her so she could give them away yeah you know they knew her so well she needs to give things to people so she would you know give them to all the nurses so yeah. you know that's that brought her joy, the greatest joy. I just, I love, yeah. the, I love the picture and I love the story because it, it does solidify yeah. truly who she was as right. she's going through a pretty, a pretty tough experience right. to say the least. Right. The other picture of faith, to go back to where I was, mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily get from the movie. You certainly bring it out as you're narrating M Melissa's stories. But what I have come to know from getting to know you and Mark together over mm -hmm. the last couple of days is your faith. And we asked you a question yesterday at lunch. Did you have, did you have that dark mm -hmm. moment? We equated it to right. Saturday in between right. Jesus's crucifixion and Jesus's resurrection. Right. I asked you a question about, did you have the right. silent Saturday as my friend Ken Costa has, has right. talked about it. And right. you gave me an answer that I was blown away <laughs> by where yeah. you and Mark, your praise right. never stopped yeah. either. How in the world can that be as you're watching your daughter go through what she went through? I can only say that it's just a part of my being through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what happened to me, and I, I certainly don't want to ever communicate that I did not struggle, that I didn't have horrific grief, which I did, as any mother would, um, or that I wasn't numb or, or had a, a difficult time. But, you know, after she died, I just was telling the Lord, I just can't ask for another thing. You know, I can't, um, I trust you, I believe in you, but I'm just not going to ask anymore. I was just out of the asking. And when I went to bed and finally fell asleep, and I'd always wake up praying and, you know, asking the Lord for, you know, the day and 
what would happen is the first thing I would do with my day. But when I woke up really subconsciously, I woke up with praise. I was praising the Lord. I was thanking him for heaven. I was, I was so enamored with that he had my little girl in heaven. I was just like blown away at the thought of it. So I woke up with praising him. Praise was on my lips, adoring him, who yeah. he was. And he is worthy of my praise every minute of the day, every minute of my breathing life. He's worthy of my praise. And, and so God, God did that for me. But yeah, I definitely struggled. I was on the floor many times. And I'll tell this story. It, it is in the book because I was having a, it wasn't a dark night of the soul. It was just grieving. Yeah. And I was sitting on the floor of my bedroom and I'm looking at pictures and mm. trying to organize and I'm weeping at every picture, just weeping. And I would say to the Lord, Lord, would you tell Melissa I love her? Shout it across the heavens. Because I knew I could talk to him and he could talk to her. Sure. So that was a good good go for me. I was going to have mm. this communication. So Lord, would you please shout it across the heavens? Melissa, mom loves you. So I was doing that throughout the day. And I would hear this, go look in the top dress your desk drawer. And I'm like, that's a mess. I'm, I'm a yes. mess. I'm creative and I'm messy. <laughs> Junk drawer. Yeah. Yes. There's <laughs> nothing in my drawer. And I tell her, would you tell her I love it? Look in the, your desk drawer. Look in your desk drawer. And finally I was like, you know, I couldn't get away from it. Yeah. And I got up and I opened my desk drawer and right on top was the last note she had written to me that said, mommy, I love you. And it was just, I mean, God saying to me, okay, yeah. I started telling her the moment you asked me, yeah. and I've been telling her all day long, and I want you to know if she's telling you back. So he sent me to that note mm. where she says, I love you, mommy. Isn't that precious? It's it, it, <laughs> more, as, as we learn more and more of the story of Melissa and of your family and you and Mark's faith and your love for your daughter and her love for everybody, mm -hmm. It's it's a beautiful picture of the kingdom, and it, and it leads me it leads me to one of the final questions that I want to ask you, which is the, the to maybe put it in worldly terms, the story didn't end how you probably prayed for. The story didn't end how Jeremy prayed for the story to end. Melissa was so open to the will of God through all of this, but. What could you maybe tell our viewers about faith mm -hmm. and the journey of faith mm -hmm. and what it means to not have the story end mm -hmm. the way you had prayed for? Hmm. Well, it, it really comes back to uh, the beginning of my walk with God, understanding that this is not heaven. This is the world, and in this world, we will have tribulation. I was grounded in knowing that suffering was part of our walk with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, right? I have been crucified with Christ. That's my life verse. It's something the Lord gave me when I was young in my walk, when I was 21, that I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Yeah. In the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So that's my walk. That's what it is. It's not me. You know, it's Jesus in me, the hope in me. So, um, no, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And, uh, but really, right after she died, I was just like, there's heaven. Yeah. And thank you, Lord, that she's right where she wanted to be. Right. And when you read her journals and you see that intimacy that she had with him, it's just like, you know, you could just see her running into heaven, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. To heaven. For sure. You know, she says about her prayers, I run and take my rightful seat. That's with me every time I start to pray. I'm running and taking my rightful seat. Yeah. And that's what she that's what she did. So those things give me joy. They give me hope in the midst of sorrow. Mm. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And being able to walk through this um, world of hurt and pain, which we all go through, some much, much worse than others. Some are called to great suffering. But to know that this is not our home, yeah. right? Heaven is our home, and he's waiting for us. And it'll all be worth it. When we get there, we'll look back. It'll all be worth it. Yeah. And Melissa says it's all worth it. I'm going to say if one life comes to know Jesus because of what I go through, <clears throat> it's all going to be worth it. Yeah. So that's how Mark and I live our life. That's how Jeremy's living his life. Yeah. You know, We trust him and believe that he has a mighty harvest, and he's doing that. A mighty harvest is coming from Melissa's life. 
I don't, I don't think I personally, just so the viewers can get a sense as to where my spirit is. Every time I hear this, I find myself with more amazement and more wonder. Like, I don't think I personally am ever going to get to the point where I'm going to go, well, of course, that's how people of faith react. I just find your story incredibly uh, uplifting. And it's, if one life, the, the fact that you guys are so committed to that, it, it is just a beautiful picture. Now, I want to, I want to sort of wind this down with something that happened in the movie and when okay. you talked about when it happened to you in real life you didn't have a pleasant experience mm -hmm. and it, about a half a day before she passed uh -huh. and and maybe i should give a little more context ovarian cyst gets removed we think she's okay right. stage three cancer tumor right. disappears we think she's okay right. you are praying friends are praying like you said people are right. praying around the world as she is nearing the time where she is passing to heaven, she wakes up and says, I'm healed. I'm better. She looks at Jeremy. I think Jeremy's really close to her. And, and she says, I'm healed. I don't feel any pain anymore. Well, as I'm watching the movie, I'm like, of course, that that's exactly what has happened. She has, she is transitioning. And yet when you experience that in real life, that was not a pleasant experience for you. Can you maybe talk about the the difference between maybe how you view that now versus yeah. when you were going through it, you said, God, that was painful for me. Like I thought she was right. better right. and that she was gonna stay with us when right. in fact, she was just yeah. letting everybody She's know that their faith was true, yes. that yes. their faith was real yes. and that heaven is real. Absolutely. Yes, so she had not uh, been really coherent or awake for a couple of days yeah. and they had told us that she was very close to dying and the room was filled with people and I asked Jeremy's mom Terry if she would sing with me and that we would stand on the side of her bed and we would sing heaven is a wonderful place so we both started to sing heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace and so I'm singing and all of a sudden just like a daughter would do she wakes up and goes no <laughs> That's the first thing she said was no, no. And you know, it's like, I'm not ready for that yet. I have mm -hmm. a message to tell. You have to hear this message oh first. Gosh. Yeah. And then she goes, Jeremy, Jeremy, and you know, he's right there. And she goes, you have to believe me. And those are the first words I remember her saying, you have to believe me. It's all gone away. It's all gone away. <laughs> and he goes, what, what? It's all gone away. Yes, yes, it's not there anymore. You know, I don't feel it anymore. And he goes, what, are you healed? Yes, yes, I'm healed. I'm healed. And then she gets up out of bed. I mean, literally. It's even more up. dramatic in real life than in the movie, Absolutely. which is incredible. He raises up out of bed, you know, and it's like a normal person. I have to go to the bathroom. So she's, you know, getting up and everyone's just like, no, no, nurses are rushing and get back in bed. And I'm like, she could do whatever she wants. You know, she's yeah. healed. So, um, then she got back in bed and and she fell back to sleep mm -hmm. and you know we're all believing we just saw a miracle yeah. because it it appeared like lazarus raising from the dead it mm -hmm. was a miracle that happened there and people ran out you know called radio stations were declaring her healing and jeremy's like you know take her off all her pain meds you know lower the pain meds and dear heather's going no no don't do that because you know we don't want breakout pain yeah we've seen the breakout pain and how awful mm -hmm. that is so she was still really terrified that you know she wasn't healed heather still had that foreboding yeah. but they did start to take her off of her mm -hmm. her uh pain medications which ended up being a, a very difficult experience for us yeah. because she woke up then and became aware of what was happening to her body as far as dying not being able to breathe, you know, just some horrific, I won't go into it, it's too horrific for me to even talk about. Um, delighted Satan, but you know, mm -hmm. it's grieving a yeah. mother's heart and God's heart at the time of her great suffering, which was the greatest part of her suffering. So that was a very, very difficult moment um, for us to understand. And dear Jeremy would say to me, you know, God would not do this. He would not dangle a carrot in front of my mm -hmm. eyes and pull it away from me. You know, he just yeah. believed with all of his heart and mind that that she was healed. So, in about twelve hours after that, is when she passed away. So, it was a difficult thing yeah. for everybody, especially for Jeremy. But uh, 
I never asked the Lord why, but I do want to explain this, that I finally did ask him why. Yeah. Why he allowed that to happen. And he said so beautifully and gently to me that I wanted you to know. I wanted you all to know I saw your prayers and I answered them. <laughs> I saw your fastings and I was pleased. Yeah. I wanted you to know I healed her there. Yeah. You know, and in heaven. Yeah. But it was my will for her to be in heaven with me yeah. on February the 5th, 2001. Mm -hmm. So he just gave me this phenomenal piece of exactly what he was doing that at that moment. Yeah. Yes, I healed her. Yes, I answered your prayers and her prayers because I saw no more tumors. You could see them through her, yeah. through her stomach, you know. I did not see them after that. Mm -hmm. And I really believe he healed her physically and he healed her perfectly in yeah. heaven. I, I I felt badly after realizing sort of what the real experience was for yeah. you all being in that hospital room. Yeah. But again, for sort of watching the movie, it, it was truly a validation of Melissa's faith. Right. And, and I'm sorry you had yeah. to go through it, but it, the if one life yeah. reality here is I think a lot of people will be yeah. affected by that. Well, by it's that so reality. powerful. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a God intervention. Yeah. It was God speaking. Yeah. It was God speaking to all of us through her at that time that, yes, I'm healed. Yeah. You know, it, it was uh, truly amazing. Well, I'm going to, in a, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to read for our viewers the last three lines of the book, if I can get through them. If you wouldn't mind telling our viewers what you hope people around the world experience mm -hmm. when they engage with Melissa If One Life. The first thing I want is for one more life to come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, to know that they are loved, that Jesus died for them, and if they were the only one on earth, he would have died for them, and that um, they are a bright star in heaven, that he wants to give them value and purpose and an amazing life. And if they learn anything from Melissa is that he's trustworthy, that he's a God who loves them and will take them through anything if you just put your faith in him, you know, that's the first thing for people to come to know him as their savior and Lord, and we'll spend an eternity in heaven, getting to know him even more and getting to know Melissa. And the other thing is for Christians. That's another thing for my mm -hmm. heart is that they'd step it up, that mm -hmm. they would know that Jesus is worthy of praise in yeah. every circumstances. And that fear only robs us of the joy of this life. And, um, one of the last things Melissa had said to her dad was many people come in the hospital room, dad, and they're worried and they're troubled and they're fearful. Mm. She said, but what God wants for us is to enjoy this life, that this life is a gift and it's to be fully enjoyed. I want people, Christians, to fully enjoy their life, to engage with Jesus on the journey, yeah. to go after one more life, to know that um, giving your life to Jesus is not a sacrifice it really isn't it's a fulfillment of really who you're supposed to be and who you're meant to be you know God in us mm -hmm. the hope of glory and he's worthy to be trusted with our lives you know and uh, that we can walk strong like that and have a faith like that and have a beautiful life even in the midst of suffering yeah, yeah. well thank you well to everyone out there I, I just I've been fortunate to read the manuscript and, mm -hmm. and be a part of the product development that is resulting in the release of Melissa If One Life at the end of March in this year. What, what you and Melissa have given us is mm -hmm. truly incredible and we're so appreciative and so grateful that you were willing mm -hmm. as Melissa's mom to share right. Melissa's story and her words right. with all of us. I, I'd like to close with the last three lines that you wrote right. of Melissa, If One Life. There are 70,000 words. Every <laughs> single one of them is meaningful and will touch you. But I want to read the last three lines from the book and, and let everyone hear from Jeanette. Because part of this was your journey Absolutely. as well. Part of Melissa, yes. If One Life is... Melissa's journey, but your journey as well. And here's what you write. I know I will see my daughter again. I know there will be a glorious reunion. Until that day comes, I will continue to share the love of Jesus and talk about the powerful work he wants to do through one life 
that is fully surrendered to him. Amen. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for being here with us. Yeah, and thank you, thank you for giving us Melissa If One Life. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This is David Hendrickson with mm -hmm. iDisciple Publishing mm -hmm. and Jeanette Henning, the co-author mm -hmm. of Melissa If One Life. Thank you so much.